Um, good evening. Um, I'm Barbara Bodine, and it's my pleasure and honor as the new director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy to welcome you this evening um, and to thank you for joining us for the 31st JIT Trainer Award for Distinction in the Conduct of Diplomacy. The Trainer Award and Lecture exemplifies the core mission and mandate of the Institute and of the School of Foreign Service to both enhance and expand the understanding of the role of diplomacy in creating a safer and a better world for all of us. A quick read of the past awardees in your program includes not only prominent American diplomats and policymakers, including Tom Pickering, um, but global leaders in the search for a better world, such as Kofi Annan, Lakdar Brahimi, and Louise Arbor. We're honored this evening to have Her Excellency Wendy Sherman with us this evening as this year's recipient. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize our acting dean, uh, Dr. James Reardon Anderson. He was the first dean of the School of Foreign Service in Gutter from, 25, from 2005 to 2009, in fact, established it. He is a Sun Yat-sen professor of Chinese studies, and he's been a member of the Georgetown faculty since 1985. In addition to this, he has served as the director of Inner U University Program for Chinese Language Studies in Daibei, chief librarian, librarian for the CV Star East Asian Library of Columbia University, director of the Committee on Scholarly Communications with the People's Republic of China, and director of Asian Studies at Georgetown. He has also the, been the director of the Master of Science in Foreign Service uh, degree program. He earned his PhD in political science from Columbia University and is the author of five books on the history and politics of China, most recently, Reluctant Pioneers, which is a study of Chinese frontier expansion. And he's currently working on a new study on the place of China in world history. Dean Reardon Anderson. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, ambassadors, Sherman and Pickering, uh, Trustee Hogan, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the School of Foreign Service was established in 1919 before the U.S. Foreign Service was established, so that the name is not really meant to be a label for the training of diplomats, but rather for the training of people for service in international affairs. And um, this lecture like everything that we try to communicate to our students is about the importance of service. And so we're always very honored to have as a recipient of this award someone who's made uh, his or her mark as a great servant of the United States and a servant of mankind, and that is true today. And so I won't steal the thunder of uh, Trustee Hogan, who's going to do the introduction, but I do want to say that uh, Service is what we're about, and we're, we're very pleased to have a, a person of such uh, uh, mag magnificent service to, the, to human beings as our, as our awardee this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oops. The, this award and this lecture series would not be possible without the active support of Georgetown University alumni and the trainer endowment. Um, trustee Frank Hogan, who is with us this evening, uh, exemplifies that commitment to the university and to the school. Born in Boston, Massachusetts, he's the chairman of the Overseas Service Corpor Corporation, a worldwide manufacturing representative proudly associated with Procter & Gamble, J.M. Smuckers, uh, the Hershey Corporation, all of these are good things, uh, Bear, and uh, my favorite, the Dr. Pepper and Snapple Group, um, as well as other prominent um, consumer packaged goods. He started out in the, comp in the company in the mailroom in 1959 when he was still at school here at Georgetown, and he has worked his way up the company ladder, serving in many positions before being named the company's second president and chief executive officer in 1984. So that paid and in, unpaid internship that some of you are looking at, it can lead to a real job. 
He is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, attended Boston University, as well as receiving his uh, BSFS from Georgetown School of Foreign Service. He's been a pioneer in the sales to the U.S. military commissaries, exchanges, and other government entities. He's on the board of directors of the American Logistics Association, the board of directors of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, and um, vice president on the board of directors of Fisher House in Florida, which provides a home away from home for families of military veterans undergoing treatment at the local VA medical center. He lives in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida with his wife, and he is a very active and important member of our board of directors, and I thank you for coming this evening. Frank? Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Bodine, for that wonderful <laughs> introduction. Best I've ever had, I think. <laughs> Ambassador Sherman, Ambassador Pickering, Ambassador Bodine, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and warm greetings to all. My name is Frank Hogan, and uh, I'm a 1960s graduate of the School of Foreign Service, and it is a great honor to speak with you in behalf of the endowment that makes the Trainer Award possible. The Trainer Award and Lecture Series recognizes distinction in the conduct of diplomacy. It was established by the alumni of the School of Foreign Service as a living memorial to J. Raymond Jitt Trainer. Our honoree on this occasion appropriately joins the list of Distinguished Trainer Award recipients who have been so recognized over the past 36 years. Luminaries all in the pursuit of peace and better understanding among nations. The trustees of the Trainer Endowment could not be more delighted to honor someone as exceptionally able as Secretary Sherman. With you, we look forward to her remarks tonight with great anticipation. When Jit Trainer entered Georgetown as an eager young freshman in 1923, we can be sure he had no inkling that he would spend the next 33 years there, let alone leave such an important legacy. I will not recount the thumbnail of sketch, of sketch of JIT in your program, except to say that he administered the School of Foreign Service for 22 years as secretary. He all but ran the school in that capacity and enjoyed the complete confidence of the school founder, Father Edmund A. Walsh. What made JIT so special was his unwavering focus on his students. Since he and his wife were childless, they were the family he never had. Though he had opportunities to be dean, Jit declined them for fear that it would lessen his contact with students. Ready listener, wise counselor, older friend, surrogate parent, father confessor, as well as born educator, probably well described Jit's interactions with his charges, who included returning veterans from World War I, later the financially strapped students of the Depression years, and later returning veterans from World War II and Korea, each with their own set of issues and challenges. JIT was the go-to person when a student needed extra assistance, some encouragement, confidential advice, and yes, perhaps a gentle nudge. He was always very approachable. Feature article about him in the student magazine of the day, The Courier, perhaps captioned it best with this headline, his door was always open. If I may be permitted a personal note, I arrived at Georgetown at the very end of Jit's tenure, but was privileged to get to know him well in his retirement years. I shall be eternally grateful for his invaluable counsel and support during the early stages of my career. JIT meant so much to an entire generation of students that there was a groundswell among the alumni to recognize his legacy in a special way when he died in 1976. What better way indeed to perpetuate his memory than an annual award and lecture series that honors excellence in the conduct of diplomacy? By establishing the trainer endowment, the trustees and the School of Foreign Service alumni 
hope that we have contributed to the spirit and traditions that help make up this great university. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This award is, as we have said, to honor those in the conduct of uh, ex ex exceptional performance in the conduct of diplomacy. And um, in that regard, I am very pleased to be able to introduce Tom Pickering, um, a past recipient of the Trainer Award and also the chair of our board. And I think he is uniquely placed to introduce Ambassador Sherman. Tom Pickering holds the personal rank of career ambassador, which is the highest rank in the US Foreign Service. In a diplomatic career spanning five decades, he was ambassador to the Russia Federation, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Um, he also served in Zanzibar, which I understand was a two-person post at the time. So there is no Foreign Service assignment too small to lead to greatness. Um, and he was also the U.S. Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations. He served as the Executive Secretary in the Department of State to both uh, Secretaries Rogers and Kissinger. And his last assignment with the department was as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 1997 to 2000. In both 1983 and 1986, he was awarded the Distinguished Presidential Award in 1996 the highest award, the Distinguished Service Award. Upon leaving government, he was Senior Vice President for International Relations and a member of the Executive Council at Boeing. He was President of the Eurasia Foundation briefly, and he is currently the Vice Chairman at Hills & Company, which provides advice and counsel to U.S. Uh, enterprises. Uh, Ambassador Pickering received his bachelor's degree, cum laude, with high honors in history from Bowdoin College in Maine, and his master's uh, the following year from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Boston, Massachusetts. He also holds a second master's degree that he received as a Fulbright Scholar from the University of Melbourne in Australia. He has been awarded over a dozen honorary uh, doctorate degrees including from his alma mater. In 2012, Ambassador Pickering chaired the Benghazi Accountability Review Board at the request of Secretary of State Clinton, which made recommendations on improving security stemming from the attack on our mission there and the loss of lives of our ambassador and three others. He is a member of more institutions and organizations than I could possibly list here, most notably the International Institute for Strategic Studies and the Council on Foreign Relations. He's the chairman of the, American, chairman of the board of the American Academy of Diplomacy, as well as my board. And in his spare time, he speaks French, Spanish, Swahili, some Arabic, Hebrew, and Russian. Um, so I'm gonna turn the floor over to Tom, who will then uh, introduce Ambassador Sherman for us all. Thank you. Barbara, thank you very much for that more than generous, overly kind, and only a little bit hyperbolic introduction. I'm delighted to have had it, but I even more am delighted, Madam Secretary, to have you here with us tonight to receive this very prestigious award and to take the opportunity, which you have generously accepted the challenge to do, to speak to us on one of the most important and current issues in American foreign policy. And we look forward, as always, to your words and to the opportunity to have a conversation with you in the audience in the moments to follow. Uh, Jim Reardon Anderson and Frank Hogan have laid out for you not only the work and the contribution of the gentleman for whom the award was named, but the fact that foreign service really means service to the public outside the United States. And in a very real way, I think that epitomizes uh, the whole life and contribution of the person it's my privilege to introduce to you tonight. Uh, I got to know and to work uh, with Wendy 
when she took on the very important job as Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs for Warren Christopher. Uh, and she was enormously helpful to me as I faced confirmation hearings for Russia. But even more importantly, in her work in the department and in the bureau which she led, in bringing the Congress together with us in the efforts to provide the needed funding, not only to Russia, uh, but also to the newly independent states, a word that has now lost currency, but all those republics of the former Soviet Union that left at the end of 1991 at the invitation of Boris Yeltsin, uh, and which required very much our help and support. And Wendy not only was very helpful in that particular endeavor, but worked very closely with Richard Holbrook uh, and helped to fund and sell, if I could say this, Wendy, the Dayton Accords. Uh, but Wendy is a person of many accomplishments and many commitments. And in a very serious way, I found out for the first time, I should have known this, Wendy, for some reason, uh, that you began your life's work um, looking at essentially social work, how to reach out to people and help them uh, in their difficulties. And much of that was focused on social work directly related to women. And I think that in every sense of the word, Wendy goes down as one of those pioneers of the early days when women were beginning to understand that they had the contribution, the capacity, and indeed the, the, the requirement uh, to be a full part of our society in every sense of the word. And despite the fact that these miserable men were standing in their way, it was their time to move, uh, to in fact make that contribution. And Wendy, over the years, I used to say in Russia, I would hire a Russian woman anytime, but that's because Russian men had a penchant for the sauce and a kind of inability to focus their attention. Uh, but you, in many ways, led that work. But that work led you, in many ways, into a life of politics, and your contribution to American political life is enormous. You worked um, first as a chief of staff and then as chairman uh, for Barbara Mikulski in her first Senate campaign. Uh, you, in many ways, became a heart and soul of the Democratic Party and its efforts uh, to provide the kind of leadership to this country which all parties ought to aspire to and to which you have made in a singular way a very serious, uh, lasting and enduring contribution. Um, you, in addition to being Assistant Secretary of State, um, went out as a result perhaps of your interest and the opportunity to run the Fannie Mae Foundation, uh, which played a huge role. Uh, in linking that great institution uh, to real opportunities to continue to work for the public good and to work in the interests, obviously, of helping women and girls around this country find new opportunities for themselves uh, in ways that uh, were groundbreaking and significant and very important. And then when Madeline came in as secretary, you joined her uh, and became counselor of the State Department a very important job because it is in many ways uh, the secretary's permanent advisor on all things. And Wendy played that role in a remarkable way. And during the course of that particular endeavor, Wendy became in effect the president's and the secretary's choice to lead our particularly challenging work on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, a country which in many ways uh, fit the bad boy category and was in every sense of the word a significant challenge even for a practiced social worker. Uh, we all know in fact how difficult uh, and how particularly challenging is dealing with the uh, North Korean regime and its approach to life. Uh, over the years, I've come to be interested in North Korea and followed the ups and downs of North Korean negotiating style. And if I could in any way characterize it at all, I would say it perhaps resembles most my experience with my two children when they were two. <laughs> and when they, in fact, 
uh, used the important political and diplomatic device of lying on the floor and kicking their feet uh, to get the kind of attention and make the kind of uh, approaches they wanted to getting their way. And we've seen some of that. Uh, that doesn't mean it's easy. It's particularly hard. And it's particularly hard to deal with a country like that uh, that has very little respect for the truth, very little respect, obviously, for keeping its word, and very little respect for accomplishing any task uh, that in one way or another it has promised to do. Uh, and this is a real and serious challenge. And Wendy did a fantastic job. Uh, we had a period of time when we exchanged visits. Uh, when Secretary Albright went to Pyongyang, uh, and hearing her tell about it was absolutely fascinating, but I'll allow her to make sure that she has full license in those stories as she continues to write about her own experiences. And we brought over a particularly dour, uninspiring, uh, uniformed marshal of the people's, uh, of the Democratic People's Republic at that time, who I thought was in every sense the epitome of what a visiting foreign leader should never be. Um, but in every sense of the word, the outreach and indeed the efforts that were made uh, to use diplomacy in the most creative way uh, to see if we could change uh, the outlook of the DPRK uh, was something that Wendy played a critically important role. And it led very rapidly, uh, some years later, uh, to Wendy's being asked to take the number four job in the Department of State under Secretary of Political Affairs, and for her to take up the cudgel uh, of dealing with Iran. Uh, I've spent a little time thinking and, and, and learning about Iran. Iran is not the DPRK, happily, but it is a very difficult customer, and some, it, it's a society that perhaps has more than 2,500 years of tough negotiating experience. So it is never a pleasure, and it is never easy, and it's very challenging, and again, Wendy has led a U.S. team in that uh, long-standing effort, and in many ways, I think, uh, should be uh, given a very serious and significant share of the credit uh, for the agreement reached last November, the Joint Program of Action, uh, which for the first time in 33 years uh, put the United States and Iran on the same side of a particularly important issue and began a process, if I could call it this way, of taming Iran's program uh, of nuclear development and in putting it in a context with which we uh, were shaping it to be a program with which we could live and in which we had reduced and firewalled away, if I could put it that way, the possibilities of Iran moving to nuclear weapons. But uh, Wendy you know, didn't quit there uh, and has immediately picked up the negotiating responsibilities for the next stage of the deal with Iran, uh, the comprehensive agreement, one that continues to challenge us, one in which there are very, very serious questions out there for the United States, but one in which is so important because in one way or another, uh, the success which I anticipate and hope and wish for in that particular agreement will set the stage for the United States to work in a new and somewhat changed and different Middle East, and if we follow the daily news headlines, the Middle East certainly captures them all. And the Middle East has shown a remarkable capacity to produce problems faster than we can think about solving them. Uh, and that's only one of the challenges. Uh, but imagine the possibility that there are shared interests between the United States and Iran. And the ability to resolve the Rubik's Cube, as Wendy frequently calls it, of the nuclear challenge will give us an opportunity to be on the same side of the ledger for uh, for once and, and very useful. So this extremely important responsibility in this very challenging job is again uh, one that Secretary Wendy Sherman has taken on uh, with all of the devotion, all of the commitment, all of the energy, and indeed all of the determination uh, that she has taken all, all of the other challenges and tasks over her long career. Uh, in every sense of the word, uh, she has moved from uh, dealing with those individual problems of people in our society who need and indeed often cry out for help uh, to the greatest challenges uh, facing the greatest country on earth today. And she's found a way to move 
uh, with her background in education from one to the other. Uh, Wendy attended Smith College, uh, has a degree from Boston University, has a second degree from the University of Maryland, focused, as I said very early on, on the challenges of social welfare in the broadest possible sense. In every sense of the word, I believe that uh, in a way that is not strange or interesting, that kind of background was an enormously strong preparation for successful diplomacy. And I mean that, and I said it to her in the room before we came in because I did not want to ever say, Tom, would you please not say that? <laughs> but I think it is, and I think it's an important, and it's a striking and a significant, uh, put it this way, uh, fact uh, that people of many different backgrounds and many different origins and with many different degrees of preparation have and will continue to make a great contribution to our diplomacy. Wendy Sherman certainly has. And it is my great pleasure to ask that she now come to the platform and that you join me in warmly greeting her here, uh, the winner of this year's JIT Trainer Award, an extraordinary American diplomat, and someone we all look forward to hearing on some of the most trenchant and indeed challenging problems of the day. Wendy, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Pickering, Tom, for your kind words and also for being here tonight. And Dean and uh, uh, Mr. Hogan, thank you as well. Uh, and Barbara, I'll get to you in a moment. Uh, to those of you who may be too young to know, and that's most of you in this room, for a diplomat to be introduced by Tom Pickering is the equivalent of a tennis player receiving a flattering tweet from Serena Williams. Uh, and I am most grateful. The roles are reversed. The master honors the student. I'm deeply humbled to accept the trainer award this evening, but I am humbled every day by the knowledge that the legendary and irreplaceable Tom Pickering once held the job I am now in and have been in now for three years. In a career spanning five decades, you must have started when you were a teenager, Ambassador Pickering represented the United States brilliantly, as Barbara said, in major capitals on almost every continent, earning the respect of presidents and prime ministers and the deep admiration of his colleagues. Thanks again, Tom, for all that you have done and, quite frankly, continue to do on behalf of our country, and most importantly, for all that you have taught me. Thank you. Thanks as well to Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who also had a long and remarkable career in the Foreign Service. Ambassador Bodine served in principally nice, tranquil posts like Sana'a, Baghdad, and during the first Gulf War, Kuwait, occupied Kuwait, where she was held prisoner in the U.S. Embassy for more than four months, surviving on a diet of swimming pool water and tuna fish. So if you see her around the campus, be sure to greet her, thank her, take her to lunch, but do not offer to order a tuna fish sandwich. Now, as Frank Hogan has explained, this is the 31st anniversary of the Trainer Award, so called in honor of a beloved former registrar of the School of Foreign Service. The list of prior award recipients is extraordinary and makes me really glad when I was the age that many of you are now, unlike my parents, I decided not to go into real estate. Instead, I chose the arena of public service which led ultimately to my daily immersion in world affairs. To those of you who are pondering a similar commitment, I'm not sure whether to offer a welcome or a warning, but I can say that if you are a student of the Georgetown School of Foreign Service, which my husband graduated from and may be out there somewhere, uh, you have made the very best start. Thanks to exceptional leaders like Dean Reardon Anderson and incredibly talented faculty, 
The Walsh School and the Institute of the Study of Diplomacy are renowned both domestically and internationally. We are fortunate to have here in the heart of Washington a true oasis dedicated to the discipline of critical thinking about how to solve problems instead of just complain about them, which is very good because tonight I have some particularly complex issues to discuss with you, all pertaining to the fascinating and challenging region we call the Middle East. It's no secret that we live in an era when even the most graphic images and actions can be communicated instantly around the equator and from pole to pole. Many people are not listening to this speech in this room, but they're listening to it remotely or electronically. Because of all this, we are not easily shocked. But in recent years, we have been confronted in the Middle East by atrocities that may be remembered with bitterness for generations. We have witnessed a rise in sectarian strife that is driving a sharp wedge between the people, between people of different ethnic and religious identities. And we have seen the ugly specter of terrorism once again cast a shadow of deepest darkness from the shores of the Mediterranean to the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. Obviously, there are many other parts of the world that demand and each day receive the attention of American leaders. But much of what we see now in the Middle East is intimately related to our shared future and richly deserves our focus this evening. The United States cares about the Middle East because of the economic, political, and security interests we have, the many friendships we have forged, and the rich spiritual and ethnic traditions we have all inherited. The region is home to Israel, our ally, and to important partners in the Gulf. It is also a venue where the values we cherish are under intense strain. So it should not be surprising that we are both alarmed and moved to act by the upheaval that now roils these ancient lands. America's policy in the Middle East begins with our understanding that the problems now plaguing the region have tangled roots. The internal divides, historic rivalries, and contemporary competitions feed off of one another. Fear and anger drive too many people in too many places into the snare of zero-sum thinking, thereby fueling conflict and playing into the hands of all who would harm us. There is a need throughout the Middle East to change course and begin moving in the direction of common ground. But quite frankly, for that to happen, the region's leaders must live up to their responsibilities. The international community must put aside its divisions and exert a more positive influence. And the United States must help to show the way. Last Wednesday, in his dramatic speech to the nation and to the world, President Obama made clear once again where America stands. We will defend our citizens by taking the fight directly to the terrorists who threaten us. We will work in close partnership with friendly governments to enhance their capacity to counter violent extremism. We will deal with multiple challenges simultaneously, applying to each the prescriptions appropriate to each while honoring our commitments and principles, because that, quite frankly, is what great powers do. And we will move forward with men and women in the region to fulfill the affirmative agenda, to end conflicts, improve governance, increase economic opportunities, highlight the value of education, and enhance respect for democratic institutions, including freedom of the press, religious liberty, human rights, and the rule of law. America's policy is to assist those who believe, as we do, that people of different nationalities, ethnicities, and creeds can live alongside one another constructively and in peace. That is our vision for the future. The Middle East, like other parts of the world, has its share of dividers and destroyers. The United States 
casts its lot with the problem solvers, the healers, and the builders. Now, some observers will argue that any vision of intercultural and interreligious cooperation in the Middle East is an illusion. We reject that because the real illusion is to believe that lasting stability without compromise is possible. To be a builder in the Middle East is not to view the region through rose-colored glasses. It is to understand that in a place with the Middle East's history, geography, and demographics, a healthy dose of tolerance and intercommunal give and take is essential. Efforts by one group to dominate all others, whether that group is a political party or an ethnic or religious faction, will never succeed for long. To be guided by hate is to go nowhere. That is the reality, and it is a fact on view today in many parts of the Middle East. Consider, for example, Iraq. The previous government there failed to address the longstanding political and economic grievances of the Sunni minority. This divided the country and made it vulnerable. A terrorist group calling itself the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant took swift advantage. This past summer, ISIL fighters occupied a significant portion of Iraq, including the country's second largest city. President Obama responded by sending a team of U.S. military advisors to assess the situation, but he also made clear that our help could not be taken for granted. In the absence of positive political developments, military action on our part could easily have been misinterpreted as support for an unpopular and divisive government. By moving with deliberation, the president was able to observe how Iraqi leaders would face and cope with the crisis in front of them. The United States is encouraged that they chose, in accordance with constitutional procedures of Iraq, to install a new governing team pledged to a more inclusive approach. In the months ahead, it is vital that the new leaders prevent a return to the political gridlock that opened the door to ISIL's rise. Iraq's neighbors must refrain from fomenting discord and Iraqi citizens from north and south must come together, strengthen their in internal institutions, and put the needs of the whole above the narrow desires of clan, creed, and faction. The more effective and broadly popular Iraq's government is, the more rapidly support for ISIL will erode and the easier it will be for the United States and the international community to help. On September 10th, President Obama outlined America's strategy as part of a broad coalition to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL's ability to threaten international security. That strategy is multidimensional and will include a systematic campaign of airstrikes and increased support for those fighting terrorists on the ground. We have already begun a concerted effort to curb ISIL's capabilities, hinder its recruitment, shrink its territory, cut off its financing, and expose its hypocrisy. At the same time, we have also joined in providing emergency aid to the many innocent victims of ISIL's violence. This firm policy is a fitting response to ISIL's loathsome, loathsome ideology and tactics because ISIL has nothing positive to offer anyone. Its method is to compel submission by spreading fear. If captives refuse to pledge allegiance, they are executed. Women are routinely raped and treated as chattel. Children are forced to become soldiers Religious shrines are desecrated. Prisoners have been crucified and buried alive. And aid workers like David Haynes and truth-telling journalists such as America's own James Foley and Stephen Sotloff are among the murdered. When we hear ISIL's leaders insist that their campaign of killing, mutilation, torture, rape, and slavery is in fulfillment of God's commands, 
we can only reply with a diplomatic term of art, that is garbage. Members of ISIL are often described as Islamic terrorists, but that is a lazy and inaccurate description. ISIL is the enemy of all that true Islam teaches every state in the Middle East. In fact, all states everywhere have reason to oppose ISIL. Secretary Kerry has just returned from visits to Europe and the Middle East, where he found a broad array of national leaders prepared to contribute practical assistance to defeat the terrorists. In Jeddah, he joined with the representatives of 10 Arab states as a in a declaration of shared resolve. This demonstration of support is critical because it shows the galvanizing nature of the ISIL threat and because it can help to give Sunni communities in Iraq and Syria the confidence they need to expel ISIL from their lands. The global reach of our effort will be on display in the UN Security Council when on Friday the Secretary Chair is a high-level debate on all aspects of the Iraq crisis. The following week, President Obama will convene a special Security Council summit to focus on the ways to halt terrorist recruitment of foreign fighters, both in the Middle East and in other regions, including Europe, Asia, Africa, and the United States. Governments and opinion leaders everywhere must convince pr prospective recruits that they are being asked to become murderers and dupes, not defenders of a faith. The quality the terrorist propagandists are looking for when drawing young people into their web is not courage, it is not piety, and it is certainly not an understanding of the tenets of Islam. It is the willingness to obey orders and the gullibility to believe whatever they are told. Like a pyramid scheme in the financial world, only far deadlier, ISIL and the groups like ISIL are conceived in duplicity and built on lies. This leads to the dilemma posed by the terrible civil war in Syria, where ISIL's ability to attract fighters surged in direct proportion to the Assad regime's brutality. Over the past three years, the Syrian government's repression has triggered one of the gravest humanitarian catastrophes in human modern history. With more than 190,000 people killed, three million refugees, and six million internally displaced people. The crisis began early in 2011 with public protests against economic hardships and corruption. Assad could have undertaken reforms, but instead launched a crackdown, including and involving widespread torture and executions, indiscriminate bombing, and the deployment of chemical arms. What started as a struggle for dignity and fairness took on a sectarian edge when Assad turned for support to Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah. The political opposition, already hampered by internal divisions, became increasingly fragmented as Sunni Muslim extremists, including ISIL, saw a chance to battle their Shiite rivals. Many Syrians were caught in the crosshairs between a murderous dictator on one side and ruthless terrorists on the other. United States policy is to provide diplomatic support and a robust training and equipment program to moderate elements of the Syrian opposition. In company with our many partners, we are enforcing strict economic sanctions against Damascus. At the UN, Ambassador Power has led a determined fight to enable the investigation of human rights abuses and the delivery of emergency aid. And over the past year, we participated in a remarkable and successful international effort to eliminate Syria's declared arsenal of chemical weapons, thus removing 1,300 tons of illicit arms, agents, and precursors from the battlefield. These measures have saved lives, but a breakthrough is still needed to end the war. Going forward, our coalition must work with all Syrians who will work with us to empower the center and weaken the extremes. That goal is achievable if we move toward it patiently and systematically, if we combine coercive measures with creative diplomacy, and if we demonstrate the kind of international cooperation that marked our effort to destroy chemical weapons. Although past diplomatic initiatives have not borne fruit, 
the most desirable outcomes remains a negotiated political transition to a new and broadly representative government. That would be the best way to marginalize the terrorists, purge foreign fighters, enable the return of refugees, and begin a process of reconciliation. Given past horrors and present circumstances, this can only, sadly, be a gradual process. But ISIL's emergence gives every concerned actor fresh cause to move in the right direction. This horrific circumstance is in some ways an opportunity we must seize. Defeating violent extremists and ending serious civil war are two crucial elements to the construction of a stable and forward-looking Middle East, ensuring the holy, peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear program is a third, not necessarily in any priority order. Let me stress how significant this imperative is. An Iran armed with nuclear weapons would have the ability to project devastating power far beyond its borders, threaten Israel, and further assist violent extremists. If Tehran developed a nuclear weapon, other countries in the region might well pursue the same goal generating a potentially catastrophic nuclear arms race and intensifying the sectarian divide that is a major source of Middle East tension. For these reasons, President Obama has pledged that Iran will not be allowed to acquire a nuclear weapon. Since late last year, I have been leading the U.S. negotiating team that is seeking a diplomatic path to that objective the talks, which have been extended through November 24th and are chaired by the EU High Representative Kathy Ashton, include Iran, Germany, and the five permanent members of the Security Council. America's purpose in the negotiation is to develop a plan of lasting duration that would block all of the Islamic Republic's potential paths to a nuclear weapon. Thus far, we can say on the positive side that our talks have been serious and that we have identified potential answers to some key questions. However, to get to a comprehensive agreement, we remain far apart on other core issues, including the size and scope of Iran's uranium enrichment capacity. I fully expect in the days ahead that Iran will try to convince the world that on this pivotal matter, the status quo or its equivalent should be acceptable. It is not. If it were, we wouldn't be involved in this difficult and very painstaking negotiation. The world will agree to suspend and then lift sanctions only if Iran takes convincing and verifiable steps to show that its nuclear program is and will remain entirely peaceful. We must be confident that any effort by Tehran to break out of its obligations will be so visible and time-consuming that the attempt would have no chance of success. The ideas we have presented to Iran uphold this standard and are also fair, flexible, and consistent with Iran's civilian nuclear needs and scientific know-how. As should be obvious, a peaceful solution of this issue is highly desirable because compared to any alternative, a diplomatic outcome is more likely to be permanent and less likely to generate new risks. A fourth challenge for builders of security in the Middle East may be the steepest of all, and that is to forge a comprehensive peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. The latest round of violence highlights the obstacles that exist. Leaders on both sides have questioned the sincerity of the other. The terrorist group Hamas continues to play an intentionally destructive role, and each side is under pressure to take actions that would make the restoration of confidence even less likely. According to the, bless you, according to the cliche, those in the Middle East who are weak feel that they cannot afford to compromise, while those who are strong see no need to compromise. But weak or strong, there is no avoiding the fact that Israelis and Palestinians must live as neighbors. Most leaders understand that. 
which is why Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas welcomed Secretary of State Kerry's tireless efforts to facilitate a two-state solution. But achieving such an outcome requires giving as well as taking a reality that not everyone is yet ready to accept. Going forward, let no one doubt that the United States will stand by its unshakable commitment to the security of Israel. We will oppose any efforts through international organizations or elsewhere to undermine Israel's legitimacy or deny the right of the Israeli people to defend themselves by themselves. In using force, Israelis, like all nations, have a duty to abide by international law. But they also have a right to insist that missile, rocket, and terror attacks come to a permanent end. At the same time, Israeli and Palestinian leaders have a joint responsibility and a shared interest in lowering tensions, countering extremism, and finding ways to cooperate where possible. The Obama administration and its predecessors have repeatedly argued the case for Middle East peace. We believe that neither side will fully secure its legitimate goals in the absence of such an agreement. That remains our conviction, and we stand ready always to help. But it is up to the parties to act. My remarks tonight would not be complete without a mention of Libya, where fighting among armed groups has slowed the economy, impeded the democratic transition, and created grave uncertainty about the future. Our policy is to work closely with the country's neighbors, the UN, and our other international partners to help Libya right itself. Here, as elsewhere in the Middle East, three fundamental needs must be met. First, those inside the country who want to build a true nation must join in support of that project. Second, those on the outside who have fueled the conflict must change course and instead collaborate to end it. And third, all must agree that Libya cannot become a safe haven for terrorists. As in Syria, the middle must find its voice and be supported against the violent extremes. In recent months, we have made progress in identifying the steps necessary for Libya to move forward, but the journey from swords to plowshares has many miles to go. Surveying the Middle East can be disheartening. But let us not forget that even in recent memory, the region has enjoyed moments of accomplishment and promise. Within the past quarter century, we have seen a broad coalition roll back a dictator's aggression in Kuwait. We have cheered as Prime Minister Rabin and Chairman Arafat clasped hands on the White House lawn. We have observed Jordan's King Hussein lead his people into peace with Israel. And we have watched the tragic self-sacrifice of a Tunisian fruit peddler inspiring a democratic revolution, a revolution that is succeeding in his country and that has the potential to serve as an instructive example for others. Today, even in nations such as Egypt, where democracy's hold is tenuous, the pressure for a more open and inclusive political system remains strong. Citizens and voters who have been given a first chance to participate democratically will never willingly forego that right. Skeptics may argue that the so-called Arab awakening has gone dormant, but beneath the servant surface, I profoundly believe that powerful new forces remain at work. These include an increasingly vibrant civil society, the expansion of social media, widening demands for official accountability, and growing support for the empowerment of women. All of this is vital because new thinking and fresh energy are essential to brighten the region's economic future. The Middle East is blessed with a talented population, ample natural resources, and a genuine commitment in some countries to better education, economic diversity, and the rule of law. Aside from petroleum, however, the Middle East does not produce or export nearly enough. The Obama administration's Regional Trade and Investment Initiative is designed to foster growth, encourage reform, and spur innovation. The President has stated his personal commitment to the young women and men of the Middle East to help them find the jobs they need by expanding educational exchanges, facilitating cooperation in science, 
and building networks of entrepreneurs. To these ends, we have enlisted the help of the American business community, academic institutions, and professional groups. This matters because prosperity in one region fuels growth elsewhere, and because economic desperation can make extreme political arguments more alluring. Each day, millions of boys and girls sit in Middle East classrooms and absorb information about the world from their unique vantage point. Much depends on what happens when three or five or 10 years from now, they leave those classrooms and take into their own hands the destiny of the region. Will they have the incentive, the know-how, and the chance to raise their families in dignity and hope? Will they be bridge builders and healers who seek harmony with others? Or will they be pushed down a more twisted path? Aside from the irreconcilable few, it is in everyone's interest, whether Sunni, Shia, Jewish, Christian, Yazidi, Arab, Persian, Turkmen, or Kurd, that the answers to those questions be the right ones. The message I want to leave with you tonight, and you've been patient through this long speech, is both clear-eyed about present difficulties and realistic regarding future possibilities. We cannot afford to deceive ourselves. Violence can leave deep scars on both bodies and minds. Hatred and distrust are hard to dispel. And the politics of division are not unheard of even in America's own great capital city. And yet we also know that there are many, many people in the Middle East, in and outside of government, who are searching for a better way, making connections, sharing ideas, creating new networks for peaceful change. They may not always agree with us or with each other, but they are willing to demand respect for themselves while still according respect to those with whom they do disagree. They are determined not to be prisoners of the past, but to shape the history to come. That is what being awake means. Ultimately, the United States has faith that the region will emerge from its current trials with a deeper understanding of its own interest in settling disputes and rising above rancor. We believe that progress can be made in preventing ideological and theological differences from degenerating into conflict, and that controversy about the role of religion in politics and governing can be managed. We believe that nations that have been torn apart can knit themselves back together, as we, the United States, did long ago, and as Lebanon did after its own more recent civil war. We believe that the battle cry of terror will be rejected because at the end of the day, it is far easier to make noise and attract a crowd than it is to transform people, however misguided, into murderers. We believe in the future of the Middle East because we know something of the resilience of the human spirit, which along with the love of liberty and justice has sustained our land for more than 200 years. Equally important, we believe in the future because we have faith in all of you, the students of today, the builders, the healers, the leaders of tomorrow, not only in the Middle East, but in Europe, Asia, Africa, the Americas, and across the globe. I say that not because your generation is likely to be smarter than any other, I say it because you tend to be more aware of the world around you, more comfortable with diversity in all its forms, and more conscious of the dependence we all have on one another. And in the case of this particular group, you also have the awesome advantage of being trained by the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. On that note, of the hope of you, I thank you for your hospitality, for your attention, for this honor, 
and in what time we have remaining to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was tremendous. Um, we are going to, uh, we, are, we're, we are running a little late, uh, but we got started a little late and um, uh, Ambassador Sherman has agreed to stay for some questions. Um, we would like to ask students uh, to give preference to students. Um, because of the time, we would ask you to be brief. And we would also, as a courtesy, prefer that it be in the form of a question. Um, so there are two mics walking around. So if you can let uh, either one of these um, young women let, let them know that you have a question, raise your hand, and they will get it to you. And please identify yourself. Good evening. Uh, congratulations, Under Secretary Sherman. And uh, thank you very much for speaking with us today. My name is Nathan Slaughter. I'm a graduate student in the uh, School of Foreign Service. Uh, I'm in the Security Studies program, and my concentration is terrorism and sub-state violence. So I'm assuming uh, you have an idea of what I'm about to ask you. <laughs> uh, my question to you today revolves around the new US policy in Iraq and Syria to address the challenges posed by the Islamic State. My concern is that we may not be accurately describing the problem. Uh, and as we all know, to fix a problem, you first have to understand it. In President Obama's policy address, he refers to ISIL as terrorists. And while that may accurately describe some of their tactics, it fails to more fully appreciate the reality that in Maoist terms, it is a stage three territory occupying insurgency. Once you cede this point, uh, the uh, robust corpus of theoretical and case study uh, literature on counterterrorism sorry, counterinsurgency, strongly suggests uh, troubling paradoxes in the ends, ways, means of this policy. Uh, successful counterinsurgency in the past have shown to be long-term, resource question, and please. manpower intensive, and uh, re very delicate tasks. My question is, is there any shared concern about this issue in the administration, and do you feel that this policy is truly accurate to address this problem and achieve our goals? Thank you for your question, and thank you for your assessment of what's going on. Indeed, uh, ISIL uh, is a terrorist organization, but you accurately describe the fact that unlike some other terrorist organizations, this one holds territory, uh, often fights like a conventional military, including convoys you can see uh, from overhead, uh, is incredibly well financed. Uh, has recruited uh, many thousands of uh, foreign fighters to its effort. Uh, I think if you listen to Secretary Hagel and uh, Chairman Dempsey today, if you listen to Secretary Kerry tomorrow and the following day, as they all testify on Capitol Hill, you will hear uh, an assessment of a very complex strategy that will take many years to achieve its objectives. I think one of the things we all have to understand, and the President made quite clear, is that we have a deliberate uh, and very uh, complex way forward here, but it will take a considerable amount of time. And although everyone is focused on the military aspects, the air campaign, the equip and training uh, of Syrian uh, moderates, um, uh, and uh, trying to help the Iraqis to develop a National Guard and to get the kind of training, again, that they need to counter these extremists in their own territory. There are many, many other aspects to the strategy. Uh, they include, include everything from public diplomacy efforts and really making clear to the world the hypocrisy that this has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, these are really barbaric uh, people who are acting in the way that they are. Uh, this includes uh, recruitment, uh, stopping recruitment, stopping the financing, uh, and we have a lot of tools to do that these days that we didn't have in the past, and we've learned how to successfully do that. Uh, it includes border security. Uh, it includes increasing the capability of surrounding countries in their own capabilities to fight terrorists. So it is a very complex strategy. It is going to take a long time to achieve the objective. 
Uh, but America, when it sets its mind to do something, it gets it done. And in this case, we are doing it with an enormous number of other countries around the world who will pick up the piece of the strategy that makes sense uh, for their own interests and for their own country's capabilities. Uh, and the last thing I'll add, um, uh, General Allen, John Allen, uh, who knows one thing or two about counterinsurgency, uh, is now at the State Department and he is leading uh, for the entire government the effort to build the international support coalition uh, for this effort uh, to address uh, all of the aspects. He won't be directing the military campaign. We have the Pentagon to do that. Uh, but he will help us to move forward and make sure that we have the international support and people are picking up all of the pieces that are in their own interest to do for their own national security. Why don't we take your question and then your question together, uh, because we are kind of running yeah. out of time, and perhaps uh, Secretary uh, Sherman can combine them. So we'll take your question, and then um, if you can get your, the mic over to this guy. Okay, and then anybody who knows me will not be surprised. I will not leave this room until a woman asks a question. Thank you very much, yes. Where are you? I won't let you leave either. Go ahead. Thank you very I much. I care about your question, too, but it's just <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Undersecretary. My name is Harry Halem. I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service, and I also write and edit for armscontrolwonk.com. And my question pertains to Syria. Um, how do you think our response after the Assad regime crossed that red line in not using military force and instead searching for a more diplomatic solution impacted our relationship with the Syrian rebels, particularly the more moderate elements who are now crying, trying to cultivate trust with. Do you think it might have, do you think the United States not using force explicitly might have harmed that relationship? Or do you think it, do you think it had no impact or do you think it positively affected it? I, oh, go ahead. Go thank ahead. you, and I first also want to thank you, Secretary Sherman, for joining us tonight and sharing this lecture. My name's Mike Fox. I am in the Master of Science and Foreign Service program at the Walsh School. My uh, question is a bit broader. It is, what concrete steps can the United States take to further <coughs> encourage the growth and stability of civil society throughout the Middle East without being perceived as overly interventionalist? Thank you. Both good questions. Uh, I've met with the Syrian uh, moderate opposition several times and uh, had the honor of um, leading our delegation in meetings with um, Special Envoy Lakhdar Brahimi in an effort to try to find a negotiated solution in Syria, and unfortunately we were not successful for very complex reasons. Um, I still believe a diplomatic solution is what must be found here ultimately. Uh, I believe that there is no one, including the moderate opposition, who are not glad that declared chemical weapons are out of Syria. Uh, they killed people with impunity. Assad killed people with impunity using chemical weapons. And the President of the United States said that could not continue. And he urged Secretary Kerry to engage with Minister Lavrov to see whether, in fact, we could find a way through that. The threat of military action, I believed, was a brilliant use of what is called coercive diplomacy, and in fact led to the agreement which has successfully removed from Syria all declared chemical weapons. And I have to tell you, when we were thinking long time ago about all of the issues uh, around Syria, no one knew, even if we could get to a negotiated solution, how we were going to get the chemical weapons out of Syria. So the fact that we did is extraordinary, extraordinary, and saved lots and lots of lives. We are still left with a horrific war in Syria in all the ways that I described it. So none of us can be satisfied until we get to a better place in support 
of the people in Syria themselves who raise their voices for change, and that is why we are engaged in training, equipping, and supporting the moderate opposition in that search for a peaceful solution. Now, where civil society is concerned, this is crucial, absolutely crucial. And everything that any, if any of you become foreign service officers or join the civil service and then join the State Department, I urge you to make it your life's work if you go to live in a foreign country uh, to not spend your time meeting with the government, spend your time meeting with people. Go to the grocery stores, go to the village, go to the school, go to the health clinic, go to the corner, go to the tribe, go everywhere and talk with people. People love Americans. <laughs> they love what we have, our hope, uh, our music, um, the technology that comes with capacity. And sharing that and having that conversation and listening very hard, support education, support dollars <laughs> from our US Congress. Tom mentioned uh, the effort to get more money uh, for what's called foreign aid. It's not foreign aid. It's aid to help people to grow a middle class so that middle class can buy American products improve their economy and improve ours and have lives and families and dignity. So I would urge all of you to spend time, whatever studies you're in, whether it's counterterrorism or security studies, to also spend time taking courses understanding how people develop infrastructure. We are seeing what happens when that doesn't happen. We helped Liberia to go to another part of the world, become a country free and fair elections. But Liberia was just getting off the ground, no health infrastructure to speak of, and got hit with Ebola. And now that country is not only facing the loss of life, but they are facing the loss of their country. And that's why the president today announced that we are going to help. We helped give birth to Liberia. <laughs> And so we are going to send the American military to help set up hospitals, to do training, to bring health care kits, because Liberia needs that civil society, that infrastructure that was just beginning to grow to have a future. So critically important. Thank you for raising it. So one more from some female out there. You all should know it's really rather appalling. Um, I am the first woman under Secretary of Political Affairs ever. Outside of my office is a wall of photos of all former under Secretaries of Political Affairs. I love Tom, but they all look exactly like him. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, Ambassador. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. My name is Kim Doyle. I'm a current graduate student in the School of Foreign Service. And my question is for, given your impressive career in international and public affairs, what's the biggest lesson or takeaway you've learned and would offer for other women who are aspiring to reach you know, similar levels of success in international affairs <laughs> as yourself? Uh, what I tell the A100 class, for those of you who joined the Foreign Service, those are the, the first, your entry point is um, love what you do, work with colleagues you enjoy being with. Um, uh, after the honor, there is the work, so make sure that when you get up every day, you are impassioned about the work you're about to do. I am not someone who's ever believed in a five-year plan. Uh, I have try to be open to the opportunities that present themselves and to seize them and not be afraid that I haven't a clue what I'm about to do or know how to do it. Skills are transferable from one discipline to another. Uh, Tom mentioned I was a social worker. I joke that I'm, I'm a community organizer by training. I got clinical skills too, which have been helpful, but I'm a community organizer and I've just changed my caseload from children 
to politics, to the United States, uh, to the world. So uh, go for it. And the last I would say, not just to you as a woman, but to the men in here, because uh, men face the same kinds of challenges about family and career now. I think that we have for a very long time as women. You can probably have it all, but probably not all at once. Uh, probably over time, and uh, the last thing I'd say is find a partner as good as the one I have. Thank you. One last question from a woman, not about uh, how women should make their choices. Security question. Yeah, right here. Right here? Thank you, Under Secretary. Uh, Sherman for being here today and for Ambassadors Pickering and Mr. Hogan as well. Um, my question, so I, my name is Elizabeth and I'm also a graduate in the School of Foreign Service and a graduate of a fellow Seven Sisters. My question is regarding, as we look at the regional implications or at global implications of the U.S. strategy within Syria as we first approach the issue, and this is going to require <laughs> you going inside the mind of Putin. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to preface it with that. Um, do you think that the U.S.'s response originally to Syria provided Putin with an impetus to invade Ukraine? No. Uh, you know, you should chat with Ambassador Pickering afterwards. We were talking about this uh, as we were uh, waiting for this to begin, uh, since he uh, really knows Russia quite well. Uh, and I've also spent some time uh, picking uh, Deputy Secretary Burns' brain about this as well, since he knows Russia very well. You know, I don't think Putin needed an excuse to do what he wanted to do. Um, he, I believe, uh, wants to show that Russia is a player in the world, and Russia is a player in the world. But I think there are far better ways to do that than to take territory that belongs to a sovereign country. I think a better way to do that is to work to get all undeclared, uh, get all declared chemical weapons out of a country. I think the way to do that is to be part of the P5 plus one and get an agreement so that Iran uh, never obtains a nuclear weapon. I think the way to do that is to uh, work for economic development around the world and a better economy for your own country. Uh, so I think there are far better ways for Mr. Putin uh, to get the uh, power and the sense of importance that uh, Russians deserve to have. Every country does. Uh, I'm sorry he's chosen the way he has. Uh, I was in uh, Ukraine uh, walk the Maidan, um, just extraordinary what people had done, simply extraordinary. There is a very long road ahead. Uh, Poroshenko, who will be here Thursday, uh, has uh, a lot to balance. The Minsk agreement is important. All 12 steps need to be carried out. Uh, Putin has a lot of things to do to show us that he actually will move back all people, equipment, uh, not encourage the separatists to continue with their activities. Some of those separatists look surprisingly like Russians. Uh, and um, and uh, Poroshenko needs to take action, which he has in the Rada starting this week, uh, and to follow through. But he also has to move the economy of his country forward, make sure all the interests of all of the people in Ukraine uh, are inclusive, uh, and that Ukraine has the future it ought to have as well. Thank you all very, very Thank much. Uh, no, hold on. We, we do have to present the actual award. So, yes. You have sung for your supper, but now we need to. Secretary Sherman, thank you for sharing your valuable time with us tonight and for your wonderful, thoughtful insights. We really appreciate you being here. And uh, it's my privilege to present you with the Trainer Award for Distinction in the Conduct of Diplomacy. Uh, we're 
salute you. We uh, praise your great service to the United States of America, and we are very grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best.